We're in the midst of a very rich verse-by-verse study in the book of Hebrews where we've been considering the warnings and exhortations of that book and how they apply to us today. And each of these warning passages and practical exhortations are given to these Hebrew believers in light of the supremacy and superiority of Jesus Christ, who is better than anything religion or the world could ever offer to them. By the way, are you convinced of that? And these warnings and exhortations were needed to be faithful to Jesus Christ in light of the pressures and persecution they were experiencing from their unsaved Jewish families and friends. Have you ever experienced that? Little did these Jews know that in approximately two years, God would severely discipline his earthly chosen people in keeping with Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy 28 by allowing the Roman general Titus and his armies to devastate and destroy Jerusalem with only some faithful believers escaping God's judgment. But to be faithful to Jesus Christ and to do the will of God in trying times, these believers in Christ needed to learn to daily faith rest in the Lord and his great and precious promises. Are you learning that? In fact, I have gone very slowly through Hebrews 4 and have illustrated it from the book of Numbers, from the book of Joshua, from the book of Second Chronicles, because I am convinced that we are very prone to daily rely on ourselves and our own wisdom and our own strength instead of on the Lord to be fruitful for the Lord or to fight our battles and to carry our burdens and thus we miss entering the faith rest life. And so today let's again study the scriptures about the danger of failing to enter God's rest out of Hebrews chapter 4. But before we go there let's invite you to open your Bibles with me to Romans chapter 11. Romans chapter 11. Dr. Michael Halsey, a a friend and a fellow pastor in the Atlanta area, has written a dandy little book printed by Grace Gospel Press called Truth Speak, the true meaning of five key Christian words distorted through religious news speak. Dr. Halsey launches his book off of George Orwell's book, 1984, in which the government of Oceania and Big Brother have created what they call news speak, a language in which words have their definitions and meanings twisted and changed. And thus, deception and confusion are created among the populace of Oceania. And this reminds me of what Peter wrote in 2 Peter 3, 15 and 16, when he said, Consider that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation, as also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given to him, has written to you, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to understand, which untaught and unstable people twist to their own destruction as they do also the rest of the scriptures. We see here that Peter acknowledged that God's long suffering was for the purpose of salvation, people being saved. And that's why Christ has not returned in judgment yet. He acknowledges that that Paul has written some things hard to be understood. He acknowledges that those who are untaught and unstable twist and distort his scriptures, as they do also the rest of the scriptures, which means Peter viewed Paul's writings as equal to, on the same par with, the rest of the word of God. And you know, even as I think of people twisting the scriptures... I've said over the years when it comes to the cults that they use the same vocabulary that we do, but they use a different dictionary. You know, 
For example, the Jehovah Witnesses, if you say, you must be born again, they say, yes, you need to be raised from the dead. That's not what born again means. They will say, I've accepted Jesus Christ as my Savior, but their Jesus isn't God who became a man. He's Michael the Archangel who became a man who is now exalted spirit being. When it comes to salvation, they don't believe in eternal hell. They believe in annihilation. So the terms they use are different, distorted, twisted. Same vocabulary, different dictionary. And the same is happening in many religious, even evangelical circles in our day. In fact, Dr. Michael Halsey in this book highlights five examples of modern day religious contradictory double talk. They are number one, grace is twisted to mean works. Grace is twisted to mean works. I call your attention to Romans chapter 11 and verse 6. And if by grace, then it's no longer of works. Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. But if it's of works, it's no longer grace. Otherwise, no, work is no longer work. Now notice the antithetical nature of grace and works. If it's by grace, then it's no longer of works. It's no longer of works. Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. You see, grace is what? Grace is God's unmerited favor. It's God's undeserved kindness. And there's really two approaches to a right relationship with God. There's the grace approach, and then there's the works approach. The grace approach is right, the works approach is wrong. For if it's of works, it's no longer grace. Otherwise, work is no longer work. It's one or the other. If you try to merit salvation by your works, then it can't be unmerited by God's grace. They don't mix. They're like oil and water. In fact, if you add just one work to grace, it is no longer grace. Now you've made it deserving. And that's why the acrostic grace means God's riches at Christ's expense is very, very apropos. In fact, Lewis Berry Chafer says, and I quote, pure grace is neither treating a person as he deserves, nor treating a person better than he deserves, but treating a person without the, without the slightest reference to what he deserves. You see, grace, dear friends, is a radical concept to the human mind. It's revolutionary and contrary to religion as God is willing to bless Undeserving sinners, not based on who they are, not based on what they have done, but based on who God is and what Jesus Christ has done for them on the cross. Salvation is a free gift. No promises needed, no performances needed, no vows, no self-sacrifice, no surrender, no cost, no commitments. It's a gift from God, paid for by Christ, offered in love, and receive through simple faith in him. And that's why you're familiar with Ephesians 2, 8, 9. For by grace you've been saved, how? Through faith. And that not of yourself, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. You know, that is so elementary and simple, yet most people are missing it. For by grace, God's unmerited favor, you have been saved, done deal, through faith. Faith in who? Jesus Christ. And that salvation is not of yourself. It is the gift of God. And please note, it's not of works. Otherwise, it couldn't be of grace, lest anyone should boast. And notice also how the only thing consistent here, as it were, with grace, is faith. Those two go together. Because faith doesn't do something. Faith believes in someone who did it for you. And yet, there's such confusion. In fact, Michael Halsey says, and I quote, Grace means that Christianity doesn't stand in a line with the world's religions waiting. It's turned to tell us what things we're supposed to do, what rules, regulations, ordinances, liturgies, and commands we're to keep to get God to like us, be impressed with us, and then, when we've performed enough, let us into his heaven. 
Nor does Christianity stand in line with the religions of the world telling us what sins we're to give up or be willing to give up to find grace and be given the gift of life. Grace has no scales by which man's deeds, good and bad, and bad are held in the balance and pronounced good enough or wanting. He goes on to say, because of what grace is, it's wrong to believe we're to do what we can, all we can, and to do that good for as long as we can, then God mixes grace with what we have done. Grace allows for no works to earn salvation and less than none to keep it. But grace has been tampered with. Grace is in the lexicon of newspeak and has been for a long time. In newspeak, grace is no longer grace with the Bible's definition. And so very, very true, is it not? You will hear people say, oh, you're saved by grace. And then they will tell you some work to do. You're saved by grace, and now you need to repent from your sins. That's works. The issue isn't the sin question, it's the son question. Christ died for your sins. Have you put your trust in him or not? Or you need to ask Jesus into your heart. That's works. He comes in when you believe. Or you must live a holy life. That's works, the works of the law. And you're not justified by the works of the law. Or you need to ask to be saved. You don't ask for a gift unless you're three or four years old. In fact, the whole purpose of the book of Galatians was to teach that the law cannot justify the sinner nor sanctify the saint. It's all by grace. And that's why as we think of God's grace, we recognize that he provides his blessings to us on the basis of who he is and what he's done, not based on anything we have done by way of morality or witnessing or prayer or giving or service, sincerity, emotionalism, personality, talent, tithing, social action, sacrifice, and so forth. But news speak when it comes to grace is true in sermons and books and Hymns, you'll find it all over the place. In fact, there's even songs like, All to Jesus I surrender, take me Jesus, take me now. He doesn't take you because you surrender. He accepts you because of who he is and what he's done, which you have now put your faith in. See, if you must do anything to be saved or to stay saved, then your eternal salvation is not by God's grace, but by your works. And what the Bible is so clear about is that we are accepted in the beloved. God accepts us in Jesus Christ. In fact, if you could lose your salvation, then you'd have to do something to keep it. If you have to do something to keep it, your salvation depends upon your faithfulness and your works instead of what Christ did on that cross. While we're in Romans, go to chapter 4 with me. In Romans chapter 4, find verses 4 and 5. For Paul, in teaching justification by faith and using Abraham as the illustration, now underscores the principle. Verse 4. Now to him who works, the wages are not counted as grace, but as debt. But to him who does not work, but to him who believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted for righteousness. Notice the word works, wages, not grace. See, if you have to work for salvation, it's not grace. And it's not a gift, it's now a reward, a wage for what you've done. It's something that God now is indebted to give you. But to him who does not work, but simply believes. Which means believing is not a work. To believe on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted for righteousness. Now notice, who does God justify the ungodly? Not the deserving, not the surrendered, not the worthy, not the committed the ungodly, and you qualify, and so do I. But the good news is that Christ died for the ungodly, and God justifies the ungodly the moment they put their faith in Jesus Christ. 
You see, the works approach is one of debt, in which based upon, again, what you have done, you now get rewarded by God because he's indebted to do it. That is not the grace approach. The grace approach is based on what Christ has done and how you simply put your faith in what he has done and God gives you salvation as a gift based on unmerited favor. So do not let people twist grace to mean works. Secondly, Halsey points out that today there are those who say that finished really means incomplete. Oh, they use the word finished, but at the end of the day, it's incomplete. And we know in John 19, 30, when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished, it is finished. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. It is finished. What a great phrase. To tell us that. It is done. It is completed. It is paid in full. In the perfect tense, it stands paid in full and will forever be paid in full. No other payment needed, and that's a fact indicative move. Yet in Newspeak, finish doesn't mean finished, but incomplete. In fact, what happened is the early church was already being bombarded with some false teaching, and the, after the first century, it only got worse. And the church fathers, quote, moved more and more away from the concept of grace and more and more involved in religious activity and works. Just like many today. And as a result, pretty soon they were teaching that at water baptism, your sins are forgiven and you become a child of God, which is totally foreign to the word of God. Or they were saying that committing certain sins or a pattern of sins will keep you out of heaven. Question, is it finished or not? Is it faith in Christ plus or faith in Christ, period? And religion, again, always confuses this. And that's why Hebrews 10, verses 10 through 14, says, By that will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And every priest stands ministering daily and offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sin. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sin forever, it is finished. Sat down on the right hand of God. Why? Because it's finished. From that time, waiting till his enemies are made his footstool, for by one offering he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. So is it finished or not? The Bible says it's finished. It's complete. There's nothing left for you to do. And that's why Paul says in Philippians 3, though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinks that he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, in his human achievements, his human works, I more, I got him beat hands down. I was circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews. As touching the law, I was a Pharisee. Concerning zeal, I was persecuting the church. Touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless, I kept all the feast days and so forth. But what things were gained to me, those I counted lost for Christ. Yea, doubtless I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and I do count them but dung that I may win Christ, and be found in him, not having my own righteousness which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God, how? By faith. You know, in explaining the gospel to someone recently, in contrast to their mixing of grace and works and saying that infant baptism, you become a child of God, they said to me, so what you're really saying is my religion is shh. I won't say the whole word. And I said, no, I'm not saying that. I'm saying the Bible saying that all religions that teach salvation by works are. And that's what Paul said here, didn't he? It's done. It's done. That's right. It's done. Is that how you look at it? That's how God looks at it. 
So I don't believe in that cheap grace and easy believism. Well, the Bible says, I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died in vain. He died for nothing. You see, grace is never cheap. It is absolutely free to us, but infinitely expensive to God. Grace is not cheap, it's costly. And though salvation is through faith alone and Christ alone, it isn't easy to believe this. It's against our proud nature, it's against our religious traditions, it's against our self-sufficiency, it's against everything in the world, and it's very humbling. And yet it's true. Thirdly, Halsey points out, a third word that has been twisted out of its biblical meaning is the word repentance. And it, now it's been twisted to mean penance. Go with me, if you would, to 2 Peter chapter 3. 2 Peter chapter 3. And find verse 9. Verse 9, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Now, notice this for a minute. God is not willing that any should perish. Now, unlike Calvinism in our day, who teaches that God is willing that the non-elect will perish, in fact, you have no choice in the matter. If they believe in unconditional election, of who will be saved and who won't, that God makes some random choice, and therefore you're out in the cold if he hasn't chosen you. The Bible is very different than that. Since God is not willing that any should perish. In fact, you think of that for a minute. That God just randomly says, you, you, and you, you're the only ones I want saved. What kind of God is that? What kind of love is that? What kind of grace is that? See, he wants all, all to come to repentance. But the word repentance is metanoia. And it means to change your mind. And you know, it's funny because a lot of people will acknowledge it means to change your mind, and then they'll say, but it really doesn't mean to change your mind. Now, Michael Kokorius writes, and I quote, in the King James Version, the word repent occurs 46 times in the Old Testament. 37 of these times, God is the one repenting or not repenting. If repenting meant sorrow for sin, God would be a sinner. See, it doesn't mean sorrow for sin. It doesn't mean regret. It doesn't mean make amends. It means to change your mind, and the context determines what you're to change your mind about. No wonder Lewis Berry Chafer writes, it's asserted that repentance, which is a change of mind, enters of necessity into the very act of believing on Christ, since one cannot turn to Christ from other objects of confidence without that change of mind. You see, when you believe in Christ, you've repented or changed your mind that your good works and religious rituals cannot save a hopeless, helpless, hell-bound sinner like you. And instead, you trust in Jesus Christ and what he did for you on that cross to save you from a hell you deserve to a heaven you don't. But again, here goes the twist. In chubby checker hermeneutics, the twist is... Sorrow for sin, feeling regret, amending your ways, doing penance, stop sinning, something you've got to do. In fact, I took this right off the web. The five steps, as it were. The penance. And again, the early church fathers screwed this up. And in their confusion and double talk, unfortunately, the confusion lives on today. In fact, Jerome who lived in 347 to 420 A.D., who translated the Latin version of the Bible, changed metanoia from the meaning of change your mind to do penance. And unfortunately, that has been the 
thinking of most people to this day. Some have said repentance is the most trans mistranslated or misinterpreted word in the Bible. Now I want to ask you a question. How many sins do you have to repent of to be saved? How often? In what area? And for how long? And did you feel sorry enough? And is it even the sin issue? No. And if you're honest with yourself, you still sin every day, don't you? And that's why the issue isn't repenting of your sins, but believing in Jesus Christ who died for your sins and rose again. And while indeed for the believer, sin in their life does break fellowship, and confession does restore fellowship. That's a fellowship issue, not a salvation issue. Dear friends, we need to repent of the wrong definition of repent. That is so prevalent today. Number four, Halsey points out how the word believe is twisted to mean commit, submit, yield, and, or obey. And a great example of that is found in Acts 16, 30, and 31. The jailer brought out Paul and Silas and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said what? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. The word believe here is pustuo. It means to rely on, to believe, to trust in. The word on is a P. It means to rest upon something. And who is, do you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ? Why? Because he's the one who died for your sins and rose again. And you will be saved, guaranteed. Isn't that simple? Notice that commit is not the answer Paul gave. Notice that submit is not the answer Paul gave. Notice that yield is not the answer Paul gave. Notice that obey is not the answer Paul gave. But we live in a day in which people will say, well, believe means to commit, submit, yield, obey. No, it doesn't. It means to simply trust. You say, well, where does yielding come in then? Well, after you're saved, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present or yield your bodies. A living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. In light of being saved, in light of his grace, we're now to yield to him in our lives. But not to get saved, but because we're saved. Again, confusion. Lastly, Halsey points out the word justified is twisted to mean guilty till proven righteous. <laughs> guilty till proven righteous. And I want you to go with me to Romans chapter 3. Romans 3, beginning at verse 23. Now the word justified means to declare righteous. It is a courtroom term. It's a judicial phrase. It's an announcement a judge would make. It does not mean to make righteous, but to declare you righteous. It's a declaration of God. That in light of the work of Christ and your simple faith in him, God declares you righteous in Jesus Christ. So how is a guilty sinner justified before God? Verse 23, we read, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, which means we all need justification. How can we be justified? Being justified, how freely, without cost and cause, by his grace, God's undeserved favor and kindness, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, in light of what Christ did for us on the cross when he shed his blood to pay for our sins. Verse 25, whom God set forth as a propitiation by his blood through faith. Propitiation means that Christ's work on the cross was a satisfactory payment. The payment was by his blood. And what's the one condition and response by man to be justified? Simply through and again, here's where confusion reigns. Over and over again, people confuse justification with sanctification. From being declared righteous to being made righteous. And there's a difference. 
Once you've been declared righteous, now God wants to, having changed your destiny, he wants to make you righteous in your life. But not to be saved, but because you're saved. Not to go to heaven, because you're going to heaven. He saves you just as you are, but he doesn't want to leave you just as you are. And he wants to make you more and more like Jesus Christ. Can you see how religion has repeatedly redefined words and twisted their meanings, resulting in much confusion regarding a person's eternal salvation? And unfortunately, that confusion doesn't end with the truth of justification. But it's filtered down into the truths of sanctification and the believer's daily walk with the Lord. So how has this double talk confusion occurred in the understanding of the word rest in Hebrews 4? You know, many will say, as a believer, you must now work hard for your practical sanctification and rest, of course, with God's help. That's legalism, friends, and that isn't true. You're not only saved by grace, you live the Christian life by grace. Or some will say this, as a believer, you must work hard now in this lifetime, and then you'll rest in the next. While it's true, God has a plan that includes good works in this lifetime, those works are the byproduct of living by faith. Is it your working hard, or is it God working in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure? Or here's another one we hear. You must do your best for Jesus. You must do your best for Jesus. The fact is we need to rely on the Lord for him to properly use what gifts he has given us, and even then God has to make up the difference. And that's why some say you must do your part, to the best of your ability, and then God will do his part. The fact is, to do your part requires, as it were, a walk of faith. And even at the end of the day, he still has to make up the difference. But here's another one. God helps those who help themselves. Not true. The fact of the matter is, God helps those who admit they are helpless and rely on him to do it for them or in them or through them. But again, much confusion and double talk. In fact, I want you to notice how some translations have not helped us in this matter of understanding God's rest and how to enter it. The English Standard Version translates Hebrews 4.11 this way. Let us therefore strive to enter that rest so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. To strive to enter that rest. you got to work in order to get it. Well, then how could it be rest? The King James Version, unfortunately, did the same. Let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest. Now, what's ironic is, as you go to Hebrews 4 now, and this confused me for years, reading this passage. And it's all based on a translation issue. Look at Hebrews 4 and verse 10. For he who has entered his rest has himself also ceased from his works as God did from his. Let us therefore be diligent, the New King James says. The King James says, let us labor. And I'm thinking, labor? Wait a second. I thought we were to cease from our works. Why would I labor then? Confusing. The New American Standard gets it right. Let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest. The NIV says, let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest. Confusion again. And the New, Amer the New King James gets it right again. Let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest. That's a good translation of the Greek word spudazo. In fact, here in Hebrews chapter 4, We've been looking here at this third warning and the exhortations found related to it here in Hebrews chapter 4. Do not fail to enter the rest God has provided and promised by his grace through faith for you. That's the warning. We've seen the subject again is rest. The word is found some 12 times. We've seen the meaning of rest. And it's right there on your handout. 
We've seen also that this is related here in this passage to sanctification issues. If you've already trusted in Christ, he's writing to believers. Because there is a rest, first tense, when you rest in the finished work of Christ. There will be a rest, third tense, Revelation 14, 13, when you go to be with the Lord in heaven. But he's talking here about a rest in the meantime. A daily rest here in Hebrews chapter 4. A rest that involves in learning how to walk by faith. And the provider of this rest is God. Himself as he doesn't need any help or assistance. And the warning is for us to fear a failure to come short of entering God's rest. And therefore, the ongoing promise and possibility of entering God's rest remains for you and for me, according to verse 1. And the good news of God's rest is a message he had and still wants preached to believers in the present, just as in the past. The problem was they didn't mix with faith the message of rest they heard. And thus, the means of entering God's rest involves more than hearing or knowing God's word, but also believing God's promises and principles. He then gave us two past illustrations or opportunities to enter God's rest as they involve creation and Canaan land. So those Jews in the Exodus generation failed to enter the promised land and the daily rest God had provided for them. And we also saw from the Old Testament scriptures that God's rest was offered to succeeding generations as well. But it was only entered into it and enjoyed sporadically, not consistently. But what about today? What about in your Christian life? What about in your daily walk with the Lord? What about in your trials and heartaches and fears and challenges? Is God's rest still available to you? And the Bible says yes. The present opportunity to enter God's rest still remains available to all believers today, though it's only entered by some. Verse 6 says, therefore it remains that some must enter it, though it's offered to all. And to those to whom it was first preached did not enter because of disobedience, namely unbelief. Again, he designates a certain day saying in David in the Psalms, Psalm 95, today, after such a long time, as, as it has been said, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. And by the way, how do you hear the voice of God today? You hear it through the scriptures. He's quoting a verse there. For if Joshua had given them rest, then he would not afterwards have spoken of another day. There remains, present tense, a rest. For who? For the people of God. Now the word rest here is not the normal word for rest in this chapter. It's sabbatismos, in which we get the word Sabbath. And what did someone do on the Sabbath? They stopped working and they rested. And here we're talking about a moment-by-moment -moment Sabbath rest, in which you don't try to perform, you don't try to pump it out, you don't try to produce Instead, you actively depend upon the Lord and walk by faith in fellowship with him, and he produces it for you. You see, the scripture rash rationale to arrive at this conclusion is relatively simple, verse 8. For if Joshua had given them rest, and he didn't, then he would not have afterwards spoken of another day several years later in Psalm 95. Thus the daily rest God has provided for you, that perfect peace that passes all understanding, that inner stability, that inner strength which comes from the Lord, that sufficient grace for every trial 
must still remain. It is still available. And it can be entered into today. The door is still open. The opportunity is still present, regardless of your past failures. The question is, will you enter into it or not? Will you stop having to control your life, and will you yield to the Lord? And will you stop trying and start trusting the Lord? Day by day, step by step, and moment by moment. Now, it's important to observe in Bible study the repetition of a term or a word, as the Holy Spirit includes that repetition for emphasis. So what word is found five times in this passage? Well, we know rest is found 12 times in Hebrews 3 and 4. But what word is found five times? It is the word today. Look at Hebrews chapter 3. Verse 7, therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts, as in the rebellion in the day of trial in the wilderness. Look at verse 13. Verse 12, beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief and departing from the living God, but exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Verse, four, verse 15. While it is said, Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. Chapter 4, verse 7. Again, he designates a certain day, saying in David, Today, after such a long time as it has been said, Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your heart. You see, this emphasizes that the Christian life is a moment-by-moment, -moment, daily walk of faith that can be entered into and enjoyed at any time if we're willing to turn in faith to the Lord. You see, yesterday's failures need not be today's. And yesterday's victories don't guarantee today's. Now, that doesn't mean every moment you're conscious of the Lord. It doesn't mean every moment you're checking in with the Lord. What it does mean as you're going through your day, you're going vertical while you're walking horizontal. You're checking in, you're relying, you're interacting, and the Spirit of God is free to direct you in light of the Word of God. And in doing so, you're casting this care. This comes your way, and you cast that on the Lord. And this situation happens, and you turn to the Lord. Because you see, true biblical Christianity is not a religion. It's a relationship. It's not a performance. It's a personal fellowship with the living God in light of his amazing and matchless grace. And when you sin against the Lord, again, you need to go vertical and confess it to him and claim his forgiveness and then forget it and keep moving on. And that's why you can have calm right in the eye of a storm when your faith rests you. And that's why in Hebrews 3.13, but exhort one another how often? Daily, while it's called today. You see, this is needed daily. Because, you know, it doesn't take long for a believer to just start backsliding right down the tube. Today, when you see other believers, point them to the Lord, remind them of the promises of God, share with them some verses that you found helpful, but don't be self-righteous and come from above when sharing this. Come from below. And notice the one another here. It presupposes that you have personal contact and fellowship with other believers. But it's time now in verse 10 to clarify again what the necessities for entering God's rest includes. It includes God's grace and your faith in God's principles and promises as it involves a willingness for you to cease from your own works as God did from his. Verse 10 says, For he who has entered his rest has himself also ceased from his own works as God did from his. Now notice it's again his rest. 
He's provided it. He wants you to enter it. He wants you to enter it right now, and then again, and again, and again, and again, and again. So you don't enter salvation again and again. Once you're saved, you're saved forever. But you enter this rest step by step by step by step by step. And he that has entered his rest has himself also ceased from his works. Now, not from his faith. It involves mixing the promises and principles of God with faith. One of the problems we have is we say, oh, Lord, I'm trusting you, I'm casting this on you, and then we take the problem back. And we cease walking by faith, and we start trying to work it out again. i got to figure this out, i got to take care of this, it's up to me. And while we're responsible, we're not sufficient. See, this isn't talking here about going to heaven one day or entering the millennial kingdom one day. It's talking about entering the rest God has provided for us today. And in doing so, you cease from your own works, your own efforts, your own plans, your own sufficiency, and you learn to rely on the Lord. So again, what's needed for you to enter God's rest? Well, if you cease from your own works as God did from his, we're talking here about grace. And the only thing consistent with grace is faith. And thus, what's needed is for you to quit trying and start trusting. For you to quit performing and start abiding. For you to quit worrying and to cast your cares upon the Lord. For you to quit trying to measure up and revel in the fact that you are accepted in the beloved by God's grace. For you to quit trying to pump out the Christian life and start walking by faith through the power of the Holy Spirit. For you to quit trying to impress God or others and rejoice that God has accepted you in the, on the basis of grace. For he who has entered his rest has himself also ceased from his works. Now catch this. It's God did from him. God did from his. When did God do that? Well, he did it at creation. When did God do that? He provided that at Canaan. We saw this earlier. And thirdly, he did it at Calvary. Calvary. Because what happened at Calvary? God's work regarding sin was finished. Totally completed. Totally done. Totally provided. And again, religion says, do what Jesus has done. Remember, it's regardless of the problem or trial you're presently facing, the greatest problem in your life has been solved. It was solved at Calvary's cross. Your sins were paid in full. Total forgiveness is available to you the moment you trust in Jesus Christ and his payment for your sins and resurrection from the dead. But even after that, you will have many troubles and trials to face, but you also have the grace resources available of stabilizing you and meeting every need and difficulty with perfect peace. In fact, go to 2 Corinthians chapter 12 for a quick moment. We're going we're gonna to pick up next time this next little section on what does this mean for the church age believer. But I want you to go to 2 Corinthians for a moment. And I want you to begin in verse 7 with me. Unless I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of the revelations, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan, to buffet me, lest I be exalted above measure. Now notice, Paul was not given this thorn in the flesh because he was proud and God was disciplining him. No. This thorn in the flesh was given so that he wouldn't get proud. That he would be humble. And we don't know what the thorn in the flesh was. There's a lot of different ideas. Some think it was a physical illness. 
Some think it was uh, uh, some think it was a false teacher who came to Corinth. We we don't know. What we do know is this: that God allowed it in his life to keep him humble, to keep him dependent, to keep him turning to the Lord. What is God allowing in your life to keep you humble, keep you dependent, keep you turning to the Lord? Maybe it's your job or lack thereof. Maybe it's a medical trial. Maybe it's a marital trial. Maybe it's something else. I will tell you this. Our natural tendency when everything's going well is to forget the Lord and just go our own way and check in only when we're in a jam. But so often when the heat is on, we see, oh, I need the Lord today. Oh, I need him. And you know what? He wonderfully delivers and undertakes. The problem is we get distracted and detoured so often. And so God allows this in his life, this thorn in the flesh, this constant irritation and problem. So what does he do? Something very legitimate, verse 8, concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. Is it okay for you to pray about something and ask the Lord to take it away, take it out of your life? Yeah, it's okay. You can do that. You say, well, God didn't. Well, he didn't for Paul either. So what is the lesson to learn? You see, if God removes it, we can thank him. If God leaves it, we know he gives us the grace to endure it. So we read in verse 9, and he said to me, now catch this, my grace is sufficient for you. You see the word is there? It's not has been and it's not will be, it's right now. Now it has been and it will be, but it's right now in the verse. God does not give grace in advance. Have you ever saw someone going through a trial and you say, I don't know how I would ever go through that. Or I don't know how I would fare with that kind of persecution or whatever. I don't know that I could be like John Huss and I could be singing hymns when I was being burnt at the stake. I don't know how I'll fare you. But I know this. He gives you grace when you need it, not before. And instead of removing the thorn in the flesh, God says, I'm going to give you the grace to go through it and to deal with it successfully. And I'm going to use that thorn in the flesh to show you your need of me each and every day. You know, we could actually thank the Lord for those thorns in the flesh. Not because of what they are, but what they do for us in depending on the Lord. Verse 9, he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect, in your weakness, and we are weakness incarnate. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. You don't boast in your infirmities because you say, man, I am so glad I'm infirm. You know, keep the gout coming. No. No. Instead, you boast because it keeps showing you the power of Christ and what he can do in your life. Verse 10, therefore I take pleasure. I rejoice in infirmities and reproaches and needs and persecutions and distresses when they're for Christ's sake. Why? For when I am weak, literally without strength, then I'm strong. Why am I strong? Because his grace is sufficient for me. That's why. So as we go back to second to Hebrews chapter 4. What does this verse remind us of regarding the grace of God? That God must do it for us. God must do it in us. God must do it through us by his provision and power, not by our self-effort and works, just like salvation. For he who has entered his rest has himself also ceased from his works as God did from him. What does this rest not mean? It does not mean a lack of responsibility or accountability to God. You see, faith rest life doesn't mean I'm not responsible, I am. It means I'm not sufficient, so I rely on the Lord. Look at verse 13 of chapter 4. There is no creature hidden from his sight, 
But all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. We are responsible each day for the decisions we make. You see, this rest does not mean that you're not the human instrument that God is seeking to minister through. You are, with your human limitations. It does not mean passivity. Passivity. No, it involves active dependence and passive production. Miles Stanford says the growing Christian is often accused of passivity by the doing Christian. The Lord Jesus Christ was not passive. The Apostle Paul was not passive, nor is the believer passive who seeks to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Compulsive activity is not necessarily fruitful as the works of the flesh attest. It's an active dependence on the Lord, but a passive production. He does it. It doesn't mean, fourthly, that you don't get physically tired or have human limitations. In fact, Colossians 1 says, to this end, we also labor, we're exhausted, we work to the point of exhaustion, striving according to his working, which works in his mind. Walking with the Lord, dealing with trials, ministry involved, can be very, very tiring. But inside, there can be rest. Fifthly, it doesn't mean there are no trials or problems to face. In fact, there are many. And sixthly, it doesn't mean that such important activities such as reading, studying, hearing the word of God, prayer, or assembling as a local church with spiritual leaders is unnecessary. We're going to see in Hebrews 4.12 the importance of the word of God. We're going to see in Hebrews 4.16 the importance of coming boldly to the throne of grace. We read in Hebrews 10, 24, and 25, to not forsake the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as we see the day approaching. It doesn't mean spiritual leaders don't have a place in our life. Just stay at home, read your Bible, you don't need any of that. Oh no, that's not what the Bible teaches. There is a place under the Lordship of Jesus Christ for elders and deacons and a spiritually gifted congregation to respond accordingly. And so we read in verse 11 the first exhortation regarding entering God's rest. We saw the warning in verse 1. Here's the exhortation. Let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest, lest anyone fall according to the same example of disobedience. Notice, be diligent. Spudazzo. It speaks of eager diligence. To exercise your will. To do what, though? To trust. Not to produce, not to perform. To be diligent to enter. That rest, that rest comes how? By faith, though. Lest anyone fall, then a believer can fall, according to the same example, like the Exodus generation, of disobedience or unbelief. See, God wants us to be diligent. Now, the word diligent is in the aorist tense here, and it emphasizes its urgency right now. Don't wait another moment. It's in the active voice, which means you've got to make a choice to trust the Lord. It's in the subjunctive mood, which means you might or you might not. And it's in the plural, which means this applies to all believers. If you're here today saying, well, that doesn't really apply to me, you're deceived. It does. The Lord knows exactly what's going on in your life. So the bottom line issue in your daily Christian walk is what? Will you walk by faith in fellowship with the Lord step by step and be faithful to Jesus Christ to do God's will? Or will you have an evil heart of unbelief and departing from fellowship and rest in the Lord to live a life of misery, frustration, misguided endeavors, and self-will? 
Because it will be one or the other. Moment by moment, step by step, day by day. But by the way, those moments by moments turn into days. And days turn into weeks. And weeks turn into months. So that the normal course and reality of your Christian life is to taste and see the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusts in him. How does this apply to you? Well, if again, as a believer, are you learning day by day to focus on the Lord, to walk by faith in him, stop trying, start trusting, stop worrying, start casting, start resting in what he has promised, what he can do, what he will do. Start trusting that his grace is sufficient. He knows your need. He's there to fight the battle. He's there to carry the burden. And admit when you're not. Are you learning this? Are you enjoying this? Are you entering it? But if you're here today and you've never trusted in Christ, the first issue is to realize it's finished. Christ has done it all. Will you enter into salvation rest today? By trusting in Jesus Christ and what he's done for you when he died for your sins and rose from the dead. So you rely on him to get you to heaven and nothing else. Let's pray. Father, thank you again for your wonderful, wonderful word. This chapter is ministered to us time and time again here. And frankly, Lord, it's what we need over and over again. So basic, so simple, but so needed and where we tend to fail. But thank you for your wonderful, amazing, accepting grace, your unconditional love, your free gift to salvation. And how you've come that we might have life and you, that we might have it more abundantly. Not only our destiny changed, but the enjoyment of this abundant life with Jesus Christ every day. And so, Father, I pray we would take these truths to heart as believers and enter in even day after day. And, Father, for anyone here who's never been saved, may today be the day they realize that not by works of righteousness which they have done, but according to your mercy, you save the lost who are willing to put their faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ. We pray to that end now in Jesus' name. Let's conclude our service this morning by standing together and singing, O oh, Rejoice in the Lord. <coughs> God never moves without purpose or plan when trying his servant and molding a man give thanks to the lord though your testing seems long in darkness he giveth a song oh rejoice in the lord he makes no mistake he knoweth the end of each path that i take for when i shall come forth as gold. I could not see through the shadows ahead, so I looked at the cross of my Savior instead. I bowed to the will of the Master that day, then peace came and tears fled away. Rejoice in the Lord, he makes no mistake. He knoweth the end of each path that I take. For when I am tried and purified, I shall.
shall come forth as gold. Now I can see testing comes from above. God strengthens his children and purges in love. My Father knows best, and I trust.